extensively on the blessing of the Lord, uh, specifically. Um, and now we're dealing with dominion, which is part of the blessing. Amen. Let's read this out loud together. Ready? Let's read. The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, and he addeth no sorrow with it. Amen. So we've taught there that there is um, something called the blessing of the Lord, uh, which is something that God spoke that will cause man to be rich and prosper in every area of his life without any sorrow, difficulty, pain, or hardship. That's what that word sorrow means. Uh, and we found that blessing that's referred to in Proverbs 10.22. We found it in Genesis 1.28. This is the blessing of the Lord that will make you rich without any sorrow. And this is the first thing God said to man when they woke up out of creation. This is the first thing man heard. And it says, and God blessed them. And God said unto them, be fruitful. And this is the blessing of the Lord. Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it and have dominion. Um, That is the blessing of the Lord referred to in Proverbs 10.22. And when God spoke that blessing, he released into man all the power man would need to prosper in every area of his life. All the power that man would need uh, to multiply, to be fruitful, to replenish the earth, to fill it, to subdue it, and to have dominion over it. And we said that power was Holy Ghost power. It's the same power God created everything with. Um, And we said that that power comes on the believer through Jesus Christ. When when, When you got saved, the Holy Ghost came in. The power of the Holy Ghost came in. Well, that's the power of the blessing. The Bible says that Uh, Jesus was made a curse for us, for cursed is every man that uh, hangs on a tree, and he did that to redeem us from the curse so that, this is Galatians 3, 13 and 14, so that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. And what is the blessing of Abraham? It's the blessing of the Lord. Adam lost it, but God got it back on Abraham, and Abraham passed it down to his seed all the way down to Jesus, and Jesus has given it back to us. So this blessing is on us today. Amen? How many is blessed? And that has nothing to do with things. It's power. Hallelujah. You are blessed. It will result in things, but it's actually power. And so one of the things we've been focusing on the last few weeks is... <coughs> That in the power of the blessing that is on our lives through Jesus Christ is the power to have dominion, the power to walk in authority and dominion in the earth. And we've discussed that the last few weeks. Um, Tonight, I want to talk to you about what hinders the dominion in our life, what hinders the dominion or the authority uh, in our life. And we're going to look at Matthew chapter 14. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, let this anointing that's been flowing in this house, let it continue to flow tonight. God, we're asking that you uh, think through our minds, speak through our lips, say what needs to be said. God, we bind every devil on assignment against this word, and we just command them to go back to the dry places where they came from in the mighty name of Jesus. Somebody say amen. Amen. I'm going to preach this text for the thousandth and one time in my ministry, hallelujah, and uh, we're just going to revisit it again, and there's another uh, text that we'll try to get to before we get done, (coughs) excuse me, Matthew chapter 14, verse 22, it says, and straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. Uh, He had just got done feeding the multitudes with the fishes and the loaves. He had got done, just got done teaching them and healing them, and he fed them miraculously with the fishes and the loaves. That's the kind of where we're at here in the context of this chapter. And then it says, when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray, and when the evening was come, he was there alone. 
Uh, but the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. So the the ship that he uh, constrained, and that word constrained means to to force. Uh, it, it means to almost uh, drag somebody to do something. When he says Jesus constrained his disciples, he had to force them onto a ship. Well, the reason he had to force them onto the ship is because there was a storm coming. And they had some experienced fishermen out here that knew the elements wasn't quite exactly right for them to be out there on a ship. But Jesus had to constrain them to get on the ship to go to the other side because God's never worried about your storms. Especially when it comes to his assignment on your life. He'll send you right in the middle into the middle of a mess. Amen. He will. Hallelujah. And uh, that's what Jesus did right here with the disciples. He had to constrain them, and he got them on the ship. And now he sent the multitude away, and they're, they're on this water going to the other side. Jesus goes up to the mountain to pray. And while he's up there on the mountain, the ship gets into the middle of this storm that they knew were coming. And the ship was in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves. And it says the, the wind was contrary. Then verse 25, it says, In the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. Hallelujah. And so what we find in this text <coughs> is we see Jesus uh, walking on the sea, but not just a sea, but a troubled sea. He's walking on a sea that is reeling from the the storm from a, from the winds it's making waves and it's it's rocking the boat and so on and so forth and Jesus is walking in a place of dominion over this storm hallelujah he's, he's so so really what the picture is is he's dominating what should be destroying him you have the power of dominion on the inside of you you have a supernatural power to dominate, hallelujah, and walk on what should take you out. Amen, hallelujah, amen. Well, some would say, well, Sean, that's Jesus. That's Jesus doing that. Well, let me remind you what we taught Sunday night, John 14, 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you that he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. Hallelujah. So it's not just Jesus. Jesus didn't do it because he was Jesus. Jesus did it because he was a, a, a man walking in faith, and he was anointed by the Holy Ghost, and he was walking in the power of the blessing. Not to mention later on in this chapter, and we're going to deal with it, Peter walked on the water too. So if it was Jesus... Just because he was Jesus walking on the water, and how in the world did Peter get on the water? Amen. Hallelujah. So it wasn't because it was just Jesus. It was because of the power of the blessing. There's power in the blessing. There's power in the Holy Ghost to walk in dominion over things that should destroy you. You can make it through anything. Somebody say that. I can make it through anything. Amen. How, you, yes, you can. Hallelujah. That's why y'all give me looks when you come to me with your problems, and I'm like, you're going to be all right. And then you're looking at me like, I don't know what you want me to do. I'm supposed to cry with you? No. You're a water walker. Well, come on. Amen. You got, you've got dominion. The power of dominion is on the inside of you. Hallelujah. The power to dominate whatever you're going through. Amen. It may not be easy and you may not like it, but you can, you can dominate it. Hallelujah. But here's what I want you to see about Jesus is that he sends his disciples ahead on a boat to the other side of the water so that he could have some time alone to pray. And if you read in John chapter 6 um, of this same account, it's confirmed that there was no other boat there 
but the boat that the disciples took. So, so think about it with me. Here's Jesus, and he's, he sent his disciples on the other side, and, and he's going to have to catch up with his disciples who, who went ahead of him on this boat that's now in the middle of a storm. There's no other boat to take to catch up. So notice Jesus' thinking uh, when he gets down to the shore. Notice his thinking of how he's going to catch up with, the, with his disciples. There's no boat there to, to get in to catch up with them. And he's just, saying, he's just thinking, hmm, I'll walk on the water. Sometimes, church, it's going to take the power of dominion in order to accomplish God's will and complete your assignment. In other words, there are some situations that unless you dominate them and deny them the ability to hold you down, you'll never accomplish God's will. Amen. There's some situations, John, going to come up in your ministry and in your walk where if you don't make the choice to dominate that situation and go on and take authority over it and do what you need to do, you'll sit there on the shore talking about, well, I don't know, I can't make it, I guess, and I missed my opportunity, and I should have went sooner, and, uh, and you can make all the ex- excuses. But Jesus got down to the shore where there was no boat, and he says, he doesn't say, well, I guess I got to wait for them to come back, or I hope they make it, or I guess I can't go and, and walk with the disciples anymore. I guess we got split up. No, he says, hmm, I'll just walk on the water. I'll dominate the situation. Are you hearing me? Is this making sense to anybody? Hallelujah. And in this, I never, <coughs> when, I'm, when, I, when I take these miracles that Jesus did for a, a text, I never want to take away from the fact that he literally walked on the water. I never want to take away, because that's powerful. But I, I, I do want that miracle to speak to you in your life, that there are things you're going to have to make up in your mind to say, you know what, I'm not letting this hold me back. I'm going to dominate this situation, and I'm going to accomplish what God has has called me to do. Come on, hallelujah. Many times what hinders our dominion is not thinking supernaturally. Not thinking supernaturally. Notice that if Jesus was thinking, if Jesus' thinking would have been limited to the natural, number one, he'd have never constrained his disciples to get in the boat in the first place because that was naturally a stupid decision. Amen. But number two, he'd have said, wait a minute, I'm going to have to have a boat to get across this water if his thinking was naturally, if his thinking was natural. So here, think about it. If he, if he had natural thinking, here would be all this dominion in Jesus, all this miraculous uh, power and this potential to walk in this miraculous power and overcome this situation. It would have all been suppressed by thinking that's limited to the natural. When your thinking is limited to the natural and, and, and the only way you can figure out to do it is in the natural, you are going to suppress the, 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 the supernatural power that's on the inside of you. You're never going to see it manifest. you got to start getting a hold of supernatural thinking. That's where it starts. You want to walk in the miraculous power of God, you're going to have to change your thinking. It's going to start there. Hallelujah. Sometimes we fail to walk in our dominion and therefore fail to accomplish God's will because the only way we see to deal with certain situations is naturally. Here's the difference between natural thinking and supernatural thinking. Natural thinking says I can't because I don't have a boat. Supernatural thinking says I don't have to have a boat. Natural thinking says all things are possible if you have what you need. Supernatural thinking says all things are possible to them that believe. So, I, so, therefore, I don't have to have what I need. I just have to have faith. Natural thinking says that I have to succumb to the circumstances and give in and fail the assignment. But supernatural thinking says I don't have to give in. I can dominate these circumstances, and I can ex- successfully accomplish God's will if I just have faith. 
Amen. Are you thinking naturally today or are you thinking supernaturally? Supernaturally will get you into places that naturally you thought you could never get into. It'll cause you to accomplish things you never thought you could accomplish, and you'll come out of stuff that you thought you never could come out of. We've got to be supernatural thinkers because we're supernatural beings. There's a third part of you that's supernatural. Hallelujah. There's a third, third part of you that's wall-to-wall Holy Ghost. That's got the third person of the Godhead living on the inside of you. The one that was there hovering on the face of the deep as God said, let there be light, and the whole universe came into existence through him. He's living on the inside of you. You are super, you're more supernatural than you are natural. Oh, hallelujah. Somebody give God a praise for that. Amen. You got, you, we're so dominated by the flesh, we don't know who we are. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Matthew 14, look at verse 26, continuing on with this story. And when the disciples saw him walk on the sea, they were troubled, saying it's a spirit. They were saying there's no way this could be a man. This has got to be a ghost, right? And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it's I, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him, and look what Peter says. Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, if it's you, bid me to come unto thee on the water. And he said, well, no, no, Peter, you can't do this. Huh? Only I can do this. You're not perfect enough, Peter. Huh? No, he said, come. Come on. Come on out here where I'm at. Come out here and walk in the same level of power that I'm walking in. Come out here and dominate this that I'm dominating. Come out here and get victory over this storm. Come on, Peter. Step out of the boat. And come on out here. Hallelujah. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. So now, I've taught this a lot in here, but I want you to see some things in in light of what we're talking about, dominion. For Peter to ask Jesus to bid him to come unto him on the water, because remember, I'm telling you, we've got to get supernatural thinking. This This all begins here. You walking in dominion over whatever situation you're in and walking in authority and walking on what should be destroying you and taking you out, I'm telling you, and, and, and don't, don't think it's just got to change. Don't think the storm's got to stop. The storm never stopped the whole time this was going on. But it never bothered him. It never bothered Jesus. He was dominating it. Things don't have to change for you to walk in victory. Dominion is in the blessing, and when you're walking in the blessing, the blessing will cause you to walk on things that are just, you know, things that are just going crazy all around you, and everybody else is being taken out by it, but you're walking in peace, and you're walking in victory, and it's like nothing's even bothering you, and people are saying, well, don't you care? Yeah, I care enough to turn this thing over to Jesus and take authority over my emotions and take authority over my circumstances, and I know, hallelujah, that this will not take me out. This is not going to destroy me. This is just a stepping stone. This is just a this is just a setup for a step up. Hallelujah. And I'm about to get blessed up. Somebody say amen. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. And so it's all right here. It begins right here because for Peter to ask Jesus to bid him to come unto him on the water means that Peter began to think supernaturally. Come on. Are you seeing this? Peter began to think supernaturally. He no longer was thinking naturally that the only way I can be out here on this water is in a boat. That's natural. That's normal. His thinking started to turn supernatural. And he, and he, started, he started getting this idea that I could walk on the water. He began to see himself as someone that didn't have to stay limited to the normal way of doing things. Hallelujah. But I want you to notice this. 
Notice that staying in the norm, the boat, which is comfortable to us, come on, what we're used to is comfortable. But notice that what was comfortable to Peter, the norm, staying in the boat, was really going to be a place of torment because the boat was rocking. But, hallelujah, when Peter began to think supernaturally and step out of the norm and into the abnormal that was risky, it became a place of peace from the storm. Are you following me? It will always seem more risky to think and act and walk supernatural. Hallelujah. But at the same time, that's where you're going to find that great peace that you want to step into. When you stay in the normal because it's comfortable and it's what you're used to, you're going to get you're going to get kicked around, man. You're going to get rocked. You're going to get knocked from side to side, and you're going to be miserable. But if you'll be willing to get out of your comfort zone and take the risk of the supernatural and start thinking supernaturally and start thinking by faith and start acting by faith, you'll actually step into the place of peace where nothing around you is bothering you and God's taking care of everything. You just got to be willing to take the risk. Faith is a risk sometimes. It's, it's faith is an adrenaline rush. And when you've got to step out in faith, it's like, let's do it. Can you see P Peter did? P I guarantee you when Peter stepped out of the boat, it wasn't like, oh, okay. I said, no, I believe it was like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Peter, don't do it. No, John, I'm going to do it. Just watch me. I'm going to do it. If he's doing it, I can do it. No, Peter, don't. You're going to drop it. I, no, no, look. If he Look, he's walking on the water. I can walk on the water. Woo. That's what walking in faith. I don't know what you think faith is. Faith is not easy. Faith is risky. It's risky stuff. But when you get willing to take the risk and put your faith in God, you can get into a place where the storm can't touch you anymore. Oh. Woo, I feel the Holy Ghost. God Almighty, hallelujah. Look at somebody and say, take the risk. Woo, hallelujah. <coughs> hallelujah. And so... Why, why did Peter start thinking supernaturally? Notice, notice what he said. Why did he th start thinking supernaturally? Notice what he said. He said, Jesus, if you bid me, er, no, wait, he said, I'm sorry. He says, if that's you, if that's you on the water, bid me to come unto you on the water. Now, I want you to, I want you to see why he started thinking supernaturally. Understand when, when, when Peter says, Lord, if that's you, bid me to come unto, unto you on the water, you got to understand, when, when we look at Jesus, when we think of Jesus, <coughs> we're more acquainted with the, with the perfect miracle-working Son of God, Jesus. Because that's what we read in the Gospels, all the miracles and all the supernatural things, and, and he was perfect and he was sinless, and we see all that. But you got to understand, Peter walked with Jesus. Peter was more acquainted with the human side of Jesus. Amen. Jesus was, was all God, but he was all man. If we don't believe this, then we're missing the whole concept of, of our Christian faith. This is the foundation of our Christian faith, that he became flesh. He became a man. So Peter walked with Jesus, and he saw Jesus. He saw Jesus get tired. He saw Jesus go to the bathroom. He saw Jesus take naps. He saw Jesus uh, get weary and go to sleep. He, he smelled Jesus when Jesus was all sweaty and stinky and, and nasty, and, and he smelled his B.O. And, 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 and so Peter, Peter saw the human side of Jesus, and what Peter was acquainted with was somebody that was just like him. And so the reason Peter started thinking supernaturally is because he said, wait a minute, if that's you, you're a man like me. Yeah, there you go. If you can do this, then I should be able to do this. Are you hearing me? 
A lot of the reason we don't walk in our dominion and release this supernatural power that we have on the inside of us is because we've never seen anybody do it in front of us. Are you hearing me? Hallelujah. The reason a lot of us don't think supernatural is because we've never been around people that think supernatural. Amen. Uh, give me Proverbs 13 and 20. Look at this. He that walks with wise men shall be what? But a companion of fools shall be destroyed. You'll be what you walk with. Peter thought supernaturally because he saw somebody like him walking in the supernatural. See, some of you, the reason you don't have supernatural thinking today is because you grew up in a faithless house. Many of you, before you came here, you was raised in a faithless church. You have faithless friends, and all of that made it hard for you to, to grab on to the supernatural and think about Think about being healed and think about God working things out in your life because you, you grew up dealing with everything in the natural. Everything you did was limited to the natural. If it couldn't be done in the natural, you didn't do it, and nobody around you did it, and everybody around you was limited by the natural, and everybody around nobody around you ever accomplished anything supernatural. And so here you come, and you come into a, a, a house of faith like this, and that's why it's important what church you go to. Huh? That's why it's important what kind of pastor you have over your life and what you're being taught and what you're listening to and, and who you're around. Because if you get around, you, you stay around people that just live and are dominated in the natural, you'll never think supernaturally. You start getting around people walking in the supernatural, and you start seeing healings, and you start seeing deliverances, and you start seeing miracles, and somebody gets up, and, and they're not teaching you some goofy something that ain't even in the Bible, but you start hearing about the supernatural working power of God from the Scriptures. All of a sudden, you'll start saying, wait a minute. Wait, maybe I don't have to live limited to the natural. Maybe I don't have to live limited to what the doctor's saying and, and what the scientists are saying and what society's saying. Maybe I can have more and maybe I can come out of this and maybe I can break through this and maybe I can walk in this. Hallelujah. And that's where it's got to begin. Your image, your self-image, your image of who you are, your image of what you can accomplish, your image of this, it's all got to shift. It's all got to change. Hallelujah. If you've never seen anyone pray about a situation, that's why prayer is not a priority in your life. If you've never seen, if you've never been around people that spoke positive over negative situations or talked faith all the time, then words are not going to be a priority in your life. But one, man, hallelujah. Once you get around praying people, supernatural people, people that believe in prayer, people that talk faith, all of a sudden you start thinking, man, maybe I need to change the way I talk. Maybe I need to pray. Huh? Hallelujah. How many of you have been inspired by testimonies you've heard, even in this place, of what God has done, and you thought, hmm, Maybe I need to start doing that. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. Amen. It matters what you're looking at, who you're around, <coughs> as to what you're going to walk in. Hallelujah. Uh, what else hinders your dominion is not having a word. This hinders your dominion, not having a word. I want you to think about this from this story. Notice Peter said, Lord, if that's you, bid me to come unto you. Tell me to come. Give me a word, right? Or in other words, what Peter was saying is, if that's you, then that's something I can do. So confirm that it's you and confirm that I can do what you're doing with a word. Are you seeing this? Here's the power of the word of God. It confirms to us what we can accomplish in God. I'm not just thinking up weird stuff when, I, when I'm thinking about uh, maybe I can lay hands on them and that cancer will dissolve. I'm not just thinking that up. That's not just a weird thought that come into my mind. That's not just something I'm hoping that I can do. I've got a word in here 
that says you can lay hands on the sick and it shall recover. See, if, 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 if Peter would have never... See, Peter didn't step out of the boat based on some kind of weird thought that he had passing through his mind and what he thought he saw Jesus doing. He stepped out on the boat because he was acting on faith in a word, a word that confirmed what he thought and confirmed what he saw and confirmed that it was true and it confirmed that what he was thinking was right. Are you following what I'm saying? See, some of you are, are never stepping into your dominion because you don't have a word in your life. You don't have a word. You got a thought. You're thinking maybe I can. You're thinking maybe it's possible, but you don't have a word because when you get into the word, what the word does is the word begins to confirm those visions that you're having. And if you can get a word that confirms what you're thinking and you can get convinced of what you're thinking and convinced of what you're saying, you'll do just like Peter. You'll step out of the norm. You'll step into the abnormal and you'll take dominion over everything that's trying to take you out. I wish somebody would believe it in this place. Hallelujah. Are you following what I'm saying? <coughs> you're, don't just act on thoughts and ideas. Because not every thought and idea you're having is right. Act on a thought and an idea that's confirmed by a word. And if you'll act on that, hallelujah, you'll act on the word of God. Guess what was holding Peter up? It was faith in the word. Come on, it wasn't some trick. It wasn't some weird magic trick. No, there wasn't rocks and stones out there. He was, being, he was standing on the word of God. And the word will not fail. Somebody say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> I'm saying, if, if Jesus would have never said come, if he didn't, Peter would have never heard that, it would have just continued to be something that he thought, something that he thought he saw, something that he thought he might could do. He'd have never done it. Understand that the dominion in the supernatural is not just for the preacher or your real spiritual friend. Huh? It's for you. But you don't see it because you haven't let the word speak to you. In other words, you've got to make the word of God personal to you. Are you following what I'm saying? You've got to get it in your mind. The Bible is talking to me. In other words, when it does say, in my name, you shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover and you shall cast out devils. When it says stuff like that, you can't read it and think, oh, man, I, I hope one day that I could become a preacher so I could do that. I hope one day that I could become an evangelist or a pastor or maybe get ordained in the ministry so I can do that. No, you, you're not making that word personal. You're making that word for the preacher. You're making that word for the guy that stands in the pulpit. That word wasn't just for them. He said in there, them that believe. In, he didn't say the preachers. He didn't say the apostles. He didn't say the prophets. If you read Mark chapter 16, he said, them that believe in my name, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover they'll cast out devils them that believe that, do you believe then that word is yours you you gotta you gotta quit reading this bible and thinking it's for them it's for him you gotta start saying oh that i can lay hands on the sick i can oh i can cast out devils i can speak with new tongues I can, I can cleanse the lepers. I can raise the dead. Woo, hallelujah. Come on, amen. Make it personal. Make it your word. And let it confirm to you everything that you've been seeing yourself doing in the supernatural. And quit staying in the boat. Quit staying in the norm. And let it force you into that risky business of walking on the water. I guarantee you, you're going to have more fun walking on the water. Come on, it's going to be more exciting walking on the water. And you're going to have more peace. And you're going to have... 
Woo, hallelujah. You're going to have more victory. Somebody better say amen to this. Because the devil can get to the boat, hallelujah. But when you take the boat out of the picture, he ain't got nothing to rock you with. Hallelujah. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost on that. As long as you're dependent on money, he can shake your money. As long as you're dependent on the job, he can shake your job. But if you get out of the boat, he won't have nothing to shake in your life. Woo, come on, quit giving the devil something to shake. Believe what the word says. Somebody say amen. amen. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Verse 30. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. When he saw the wind, when he saw the wind, when he saw the wind, whew, I'm going to finish the rest of this message talking about this concept here. Lack of focus will hinder your dominion. Notice the process to walking in dominion here in this story for Peter walking in dominion and then losing dominion. Both processes began with what he was focusing on. Are you following me? When he saw Jesus walking on the water, he thought, I can walk on the water too. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and thought, what in the world am I doing out here on this water? I can't walk on water. But both processes to walking in dominion and losing the dominion began with his focus. Are you hearing me? Understand, fear will knock you out of dominion, but fear is really a focus problem. It's a focus problem. Fear didn't grip Peter, and then he looked at the wind and said, I can't do this. No, he looked at the wind, and then fear gripped him. Follow me, please. Fear doesn't just grip you. It's, it, it grips you as a result of what you're focusing on. If you're not walking in dominion today and you're in fear, it's, it's because of what you're focusing on. I've dealt with anxiety, and I've had a couple panic attacks in my life, but I realized that it was a focus issue. And I began to defeat it. I began to defeat it in my life when I found out I was going into anxiety was gripping me as I was believing something that wasn't true. And I begin to say, wait a minute, this is not true about me. I'm, um, I'm, I'm not having a heart attack right now. I, I'm not, my heart is good. I'm not having this. This is not what's happening to me right now. This is, I'm, that pain is not what it is. Are you following me? And I quit focusing on what I was feeling, and I quit focusing on what I was seeing, and I immediately shifted my focus to the truth and the Word of God, and I, could, I, I began to overcome anxiety and all of those things because I realized it was a, it was a focus issue. That, that was gripping me and making me feel like I was going to die, hallelujah, is because I, I never changed my focus. I never changed my focus through the whole situation. But when I realized my focus was off and I got my focus back on where it needed to be, I could beat that. Hallelujah. You've got to learn to shift your focus from the circumstances to the victory. How do I do that? You do it just like Peter. Peter walked in dominion over the water and the storm while he was focused on the dominion and the victory of Jesus over the storm. While he was focused on Jesus' victory over the storm, he was in victory. But the minute he began to focus on the wind, the minute he began to focus on the circumstances and not the victory... He lost his dominion. Fear overwhelmed him, and he began to sink in what he was walking on. Hallelujah. Are you following what I'm saying? 
You've got to keep your focus on the victory. Say that with me. Keep your focus on the victory. How do I... <coughs> How do I keep it on the victory? The same way Peter did. I keep my focus on Jesus. I keep my focus on Jesus. If I keep my focus on Jesus, who is in victory, guess what's going to happen to me? I'm going to stay in victory. Are you hearing me? Thank you, Jesus. You're focused on how bad you're feeling. You're focused on how bad things are going. You're focused on everything that's going on around you. you got to focus on Jesus. He's not troubled by your storm. He's walking on it. Come on, somebody. <coughs> Excuse me. Hallelujah. The same thing. <clears throat> this is a picture. When, when Peter, it's a picture of Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 2. When, 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 when Peter saw Jesus in victory over the storm, dominating the storm, he, he came into the same place. The Bible says Jesus was raised from the dead and set at the right hand of the Father in heavenly places above all power, dominion, might, and any, anything that has a name in this world and the world to come and all things are under his feet. Then Ephesians 2 says... He has raised us up together to set with him in heavenly places. Oh, man, I'm telling you. <coughs> this is the baptism into Christ. That what happened to him happened to me. Are you hearing me? And if I'll focus on his victory... Guess what? I'm going to walk in his victory. It's a focus problem because if you understand what has happened to him has happened to me because he got up, I got up. Because he won victory, I got the victory. And I focus on that. Guess I'm going to walk in that same victory. It's a focus issue. Quit focusing on the wind. Quit focusing on the storm. Quit focusing on the water and focus on Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Turn Facebook off. Turn Twitter off. Tell them I'll call you back later. Maybe you won't. Hallelujah. I'll call you back later because if all you're going to do is talk to me about the wind, I don't want to talk about the wind. I want to talk about Jesus. I want to talk about victory. Come on, somebody. Well, I just got a bad doctor's report. Well, it doesn't mean you got to meditate on it all day long. Woo, hallelujah. My God, when you come out of the office, if you don't want to be rude, just wait till you get out of the office. And say, I rebuke everything you said, doctor. You're not Jesus. You're not the word of God. I believe the report of the Lord. And by his stripes, I'm healed. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Focus on the victory. Focus on the victory. Where am I at? Hallelujah. Oh, excuse me. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. So when, when Jesus, to, I want to go to Matthew chapter 17. Let me end focusing on Matthew chapter 17. When Jesus took, um, this is when Jesus took Peter, James, and John up on a mountain, uh, which we know as the mountain of transfiguration. Um, and he was transfigured before him, which means basically he was turned inside out. In other words, they saw a transfigured Jesus. They saw him in full spirit form, and he was talking to uh, Moses and Elijah there on the mountain. And so they had this moment on the mountain and they're on their way back down from the mountain. Now, while he's up there with Peter, James, and John, he left his other disciples down there at the bottom of the mountain. And while they were down there, um, a man brought a demonized boy, his son who had been battling with demons, to uh, his disciples. <coughs> and so Jesus is coming back down the mountain, and he's met with this man. And look at verse 14. 
And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him, saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he's a lunatic and sore vexed. For oft times he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. And I brought him to, the, to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Basically, this boy was most likely ha- was having like epileptic seizures, but it was a devil. Um, and that can be a spirit when people are having those. But the, he, was, he was falling into convulsions, and it would happen when he was around water or fire because that devil wanted him to get burned or drowned or whatever. He's trying to kill him. Well, he brings him to the disciples, and the disciples... Uh, While Jesus is up on this mountain with Peter, James, and John, they could not get the devil out of him. Now, understand the disciples had already been casting out devils. Um, They come back to Jesus on one mission trip and said, you know, the devils are subject unto us. Jesus said, well, don't rejoice because the devils are subject unto you. Rejoice because your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. They had already seen uh, devils come out of people through using the authority of the name of Jesus. Now, But this boy, they couldn't get delivered. Well, look what Jesus says to the man, Matthew 17, verse 17. Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and it departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out? So the reason they're asking this is because they'd already done it. And and they've already walked in this dominion. And they're trying to figure out, why aren't we walking in this dominion now? Why aren't we walking in this this authority over the Spirit now? Look at what Jesus says, verse 20. Jesus says to them, because of your unbelief. And then he goes on to say, for verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say to this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible to, unto you. Now, I want you to see this. He's, he's letting them know that it's not, it's not a faith issue. It's an unbelief issue. Okay? And then he says, how be it, verse 21, this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. And I'll deal with that in just a moment. Unbelief will hinder your dominion. Your, your dominion, you not walking in dominion is not a faith issue, it's an unbelief issue. What are you talking about, Pastor? Here's a principle that, that this text uh, reveals to us that we need to learn is this. You can have faith and unbelief at the same time. It's not one or the other. It's not, well, if you have unbelief, you don't have faith, or if you have faith, there's no unbelief. No, you can have both of these operating at the same time. And what happens is your unbelief can cancel out or override your faith. And that's why you don't see the supernatural power of God working in your life. And I'll explain this to you. You don't need more faith. Oh, I didn't get a lot of amens on that. All right, hallelujah. You don't need more faith. You have enough faith. Amen. Say amen. You, you have enough faith. What, what are you talking about, Pastor? It's the faith you got saved by. That's the faith you're going to get healed by. That's the faith you're going to get provisioned by. That's the faith that you're going to walk in dominion by. That's the faith that you're going to walk on the water by and conquer the storms in your life. It's the faith that you got saved by, and that faith was given to you. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. To every, ma- every man's been dealt the measure of faith. I've always defined faith as the ability to be convinced of what you can't see. See, understand something. When you got saved, or since you got saved, you received this supernatural ability called faith to be convinced of the Word of God when there's no physical evidence for it. How did you get saved? Because you never saw Jesus die. You never witnessed it. But are you convinced of it? That's not a one. That's not. I want you to help, help, help us, Lord. That's not a one-time thing that ha- faith. Listen, listen to me. Listen, listen, please listen. Faith is not something you possess and then you lose, and then you possess it and then you lose it. Once, 
when you believe to get saved, that ability to be convinced of what you cannot see, it came in, and you have that ability forever now. Is that making sense to everybody? See, I think sometimes y'all think, well, I, faith came to me for this session, but it didn't come to me for this, and faith came to me for this, and then I didn't have it. No, it doesn't come and go. You are a person of faith now. You have an ability, if you'll get into the Word of God, you hear me? If you'll get into the Word of God, you have the ability to be convinced of what the Word says, even though there's no evidence for it. And that's always there. That'll never leave. You have that in you. Are you following what I'm saying? So, it's, so you don't need more faith. You just need to work the faith that you have. Are you hearing me? Whew, hallelujah. <clears throat> so <clears throat> you, it's not a faith issue. It's an unbelief issue. It's not that I need more faith. It's that I need to get rid of the unbelief. Are you following me? Because what happens is I've got this ability to be, to be convinced of what I cannot see, but because, and I'm getting ahead of myself, but I'll show you, because of what I can see, what I can see is where the unbelief comes from, and what I can see overrides what I can't see. Are you hearing me? And then my faith, I don't lose it. It just quits working. Whoo. Because I'm focusing on what I can't see. Unbelief comes from what you can see. It comes from the sense knowledge realm. Look at the story. I want, I want you to look at the same story. But you, you got time? Look at the same story, but look at it from Mark's account. Mark 9 and 17. And one of the multitude answered and said, Matt, same story, just Mark's, can, uh, and he tells us some things that Matthew doesn't tell us. One of the multitude answered and said, Master, I brought unto you my son, which has a dumb spirit. There he calls it a dumb spirit. Wherever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth and gnashes with his teeth. That's where we get the idea of a, a seizure, a convulsion. And he pineth away, and I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out. Excuse me. <coughs> And they could not. He answereth him and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto me. And when he saw him, when he saw the boy, straightway the spirit tear him. He started going into these convulsions. And he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. And Jesus asked his father, how long is it ago since this came unto him? How long has he been doing this? And notice what the father said uh, of a child, since he's been a child. I don't know how old he is now, but evidently this has been a, a long time. And then he says, verse 22, and oft times it has cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. It's not about can I do something, it's can you believe I can do it, I can do it, but can you believe? Now look at what the father says. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. Right? Notice the father said, I believe, but I also got unbelief. The father had faith and unbelief at the same time. We know he had faith. Why? Because he brought him to Jesus. If he didn't believe, he wouldn't have brought him to Jesus. Are you hearing me? Many of you have faith, and, 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 and one of the other ways that it's seen, other than the fact that you're saved, is in the fact that you pray or you speak the Word of God or you come up for prayer. Understand something. That's, a, that's faith. That means you believe or you wouldn't do it. And guess what? That's enough faith to get the miracle. Remember the other text? Oh, hallelujah. Remember the other text? Jesus said, it's your unbelief. It's not your faith that you couldn't cast them out, disciples. It's your unbelief. Because if you have faith as the grain of a mustard seed, you can speak to the mountain, and the mountain will obey you. 
Because it's not about the amount of faith. A mustard seed's so small, you could lose it in the, you could hide it in the crevice of your hand. Jesus is saying it's not about the amount of your faith, it's about the amount of your unbelief. The faith that, it, what kind of faith did it take for you to get saved? Lord. Huh? Jesus, you're Lord. Boom, you got saved. A creative miracle took place on the inside of you. Coming up to a, getting prayed for in a prayer line, that's enough faith to get healed. In the name of Jesus, devil, I command you to get out of here. That's enough faith. So it's not about the amount of faith. It's not like I need to say it seven more times. I need to jump when I say it. I need to spin when I say it. I need to say it and then pray in tongues for an hour and then say it again. No, it's you need to believe it. It's not the amount of faith you're using. It's the amount of unbelief that's drowning out your faith. Are you seeing this? Oh, hallelujah. Come on, Sean, hallelujah. See, he had, he had unbelief at the same time. Where does the unbelief come from? Well, it comes from what you see. What did he ask the father? He said, how long has this been? He says, he's been a child. And oftentimes, I've seen this happen. Well, here, here's the problem with the father is he believed, but he had so much unbelief that stemmed from the, all of the time that he saw this issue. You know why a lot of people, it's hard for people to receive healing from an issue they've had for a long time is because they've seen it over and over and over to the point that they've developed more unbelief about it than they have faith about. Are you hearing me? And so it takes a while sometimes of getting into the Word and, and, and strengthening your faith and, and, and getting out of what you see and what you feel, hallelujah, in order to receive the miracle. That's why sometimes you've got to take things that you've dealt with for so long and bring them to a healing crusade where somebody that don't know nothing about your situation can lay hands on you and pray for you because they haven't seen your struggle, so they don't have as much unbelief about it as you. Are you, is this making sense to you? Amen. Hallelujah. Unbelief comes through the senses. I, I'm, 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 just, just bear with me, please. So, verse 25. Verse 25 of this, I think of Mark 9. I'm kind of confused where I'm at. Hallelujah. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, this is Mark's account of this. He rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, You dumb, deaf spirit, I charge you, come out of him and enter him and enter no more into him. And the spirit, watch what the spirit did. It cried. It rent him sore, so it probably threw him down and wallowed him around on the ground. And then it came out of him, and he was as one dead. He probably laid there just, he was just lifeless. In so much that many said, many, everybody thought he was dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. Watch this. G remember, Jesus told the disciples, the reason you couldn't walk in dominion and cast this devil out is because of your unbelief. And we say unbelief comes from the senses, from what you see. That's where you develop unbelief at. Most likely... What happened when the disciples tried to cast the devil out is this devil did what he did with Jesus. It prop when they told that devil to come out, he probably cried. The devil screamed through the boy. The devil made the boy roll around until he got hurt. And then and then the boy probably laid there like he was dead. And everybody thought he was dead, so the disciples probably thought, We killed him. We didn't get the devil out. Right? Are you hearing me? He didn't come out of him. And so what the disciples saw probably created enough unbelief in them that this boy wasn't delivered, which allowed that demon the access to just come right back in and stay. Are you following me? But notice when Jesus told the devil to come out, 
He did all of that theatrics. He did all of the theatrics. He screamed. He rolled around. He laid there like he was dead. But notice, none of that moved Jesus. Are you hearing me? That's why when, if you're going to cast the devil out and they might scream and holler and all that, you can't be moved by all of that. You got to believe, I said it, that devil's got to obey and he's got to come out. They can scream and squall all they want to. But I'm not going to give in. I'm not wrestling with them. I'm not going to hold them down. I'm not going to throw oil on them and put a Bible over their face. I told that devil to come out. They can scream for 20 minutes they want to, but he's coming out. Jesus wasn't moved by what he saw. And he just reached down and he picked the boy up. And he was fine. Are you hearing me? The reason the disciples couldn't cast the devil out is because they were too moved by what they saw. What they saw developed so much unbelief in them that they could not believe that the devil obeyed them. And even though they had done it before, they couldn't walk in it then because they were too dominated by what they saw. And it put too much unbelief in them, and that unbelief uh, overrode their faith. Are you seeing me? And see, remember Jesus said, he said, but this kind, after he says, after he says, he says, they said, why couldn't we cast him out in Matthew? They, he said, because of your unbelief. And then he said, you know, faith is a grain of mustard seed. If you say this mountain be removed, it should obey you. Then he says, how be it, this kind comes not out but by prayer and fasting. Jesus wasn't saying that there's certain demons, that special demons that only come out by prayer and fasting. That's not what he was saying. Because if prayer and fasting was the issue, the first thing Jesus would have said to the disciples was, the reason you couldn't have cast him out is because you haven't been praying and fasting. Because the disciples hadn't been praying and fasting. You remember? I'm done. I closed my notes. Listen. The disciples hadn't been praying and fasting. Because remember when John's disciples come to Jesus and says, why don't your disciples fast like us? And he's like, as long as I'm with them, they, they don't need to fast. But I'm going to be leaving one day, and then they'll fast and pray. And they did. The apostles fasted and prayed after the resurrection through the book of Acts. But while they was with Jesus, they never fasted and prayed. But when they said, why couldn't we cast it out? That wasn't his answer. His answer was unbelief. Then he said, this kind comes out not but by prayer and fasting. What he's saying there is this type of spirit that's going to squall and cry and all of that stuff, you're going to have to be praying and fasting in order to stay in faith to get this out because what prayer and fasting does, prayer and fasting doesn't get the devil out. Prayer and fasting gets the unbelief out. Are you hearing me? What prayer and fasting does, prayer and fasting gets the unbelief out so that you can walk in faith and not be moved by your senses because when you're praying and fasting, you are denying your physical senses. The reason your physical senses are so strong is because you exercise them so much. And the reason you exercise them so much is because you don't pray and fast. Because when you pray and fast, you're denying the flesh. You're denying the physical senses, and you're exercising your spiritual sense. And what happens is the more you exercise your spiritual sense and the more you quit exercising your physical senses, your spiritual sense gets stronger than your physical sense. And you are not as moved by what you see. You're more moved by what the Holy Spirit is saying to you. Are you hearing me? Jesus prayed and fasted. That's why when the boy did all of that and the devil did all of that, he just reached down and picked him up. He wasn't moved by it because his physical senses were deadened. What are you doing when you're praying? You're operating your spiritual sense. You got your ear turned to heaven. You're talking to God. Are you hearing me? You're not, you're not, you're not operating in your physical sense. What do you do when you fast? When you fast if you're really fasting, right, you're... <clears throat> If you're really fasting and you're not eating, you're not just starving yourself, what happens when you fast? You don't want to be around people when you're not eating. I barely want to be around people when I am eating. So if I'm not eating, I don't want to be around nobody. Number two, I don't want to watch TV because everything on TV is a, is, is a, is a cheeseburger and a pizza and a steak. Huh? 
So I'm not watching TV. I'm not talking to anybody. I don't want to be around anybody. I really don't want to go anywhere because I don't have the strength to go anywhere. So what's there left to do? All of my physical senses are shutting down. So now I can spend time in the word prayer. Are you hearing me? And so when I come out of prayer and fasting, all of the senses that produce the unbelief in my life are dying. And I'm not as moved by what's going on around me. Hallelujah. But in that time of prayer and fasting, I've exercised and strengthened my spiritual sense. And I'm more moved by God and what the Word says than what I see. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. And so I can walk in my dominion and I can walk in my authority. And the devil can talk all he wants to, but I can't hear him. And people can say what they want to, but I can't hear him because I've been spending time in the Word and I'm more convinced of what God says about me than what man says about me. I'm more convinced of what I'm hearing in the Holy Spirit than what I'm feeling in my natural body. Hallelujah. Are you following me? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Have you received tonight? Hallelujah. If you've received tonight, give God a praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Let's stand. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for your word, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for the power to walk in dominion, God. And God, we thank you, Lord, that we have the authority. Woo, hallelujah. We have the power, the ability to walk on what should take us out, God. <coughs> And I'm praying tonight in this house that everyone in this place that's going through things, facing things that should take them out, that God, they begin to think supernaturally, that they begin to quit focusing on the wind, focusing on the circumstances, and start focusing on the victory. And God, they begin to think and they begin to see and they get into the word of God and let the word confirm to them that they can walk on this thing that it doesn't have to take them out, that it doesn't have to destroy them, Lord God, that they can conquer it, that they can defeat it, Lord God. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, God, in the mighty name of Jesus. God, I be- I'm praying, God, that the word would become personal to us, that, God, that they would see that the congregation here, the people here would begin to see that the word is talking specifically to me. Oh, hallelujah, that God, that word is not just for a preacher. It's not just for an apostle. It's not just for somebody with a title, God, but it's for me. Whatever that word says I can do, I can do. Whatever that word says I can be, I can be. Oh, my. God, break the natural thinking in our life. Woo, hallelujah. Let us think supernatural. Talk supernatural. Walk supernatural. God, we're all guilty of God walking and talking and thinking natural, God. But we are supernatural beings, God. Remind us, Holy Ghost, of who we are. Oh, remind us of who we are. We are water walkers, Lord. We are water walkers. Shout that with me. I am a water walker. Come on. I can walk on what's trying to take me out. Say it. Come on. I can walk. Yeah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Say this, with, I will not fail when it comes to the assignment of God. I'm a supernatural being. Woo, hallelujah. All things are not possible because I have what I need. All things are possible because I have faith. Hallelujah. Come on, shout it with me. All things are possible because I have faith. I may not have what I need, but I got faith. And if I got faith, I got everything I need. Oh, hallelujah. Come on. Come on. Come on. Oh, Philip, how are we going to feed these people? We ain't got enough money, Jesus. We ain't got enough food. We just got a boy's lunch. Yeah, but we got faith. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. Shout it. I got faith. Come on. When did you get it? When you got saved. Hallelujah. Come on. The same faith you got saved by. The same faith you'll get healed by. That's the same faith you'll get delivered by. Come on. Shout it today. I got faith to conquer. Come on. I got faith. 
to be healed. Come on, I got faith to get a breakthrough. I got faith to walk in victory. It's the same faith I got saved by. Come on, it's God's faith. Woo, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, amen. Woo. Well, I don't have as much faith as you. Well, wait a minute. Did I get saved more than you? No, we got saved the same. And the reason you think I got more faith in you is because I might be working my faith more. You just need to work your faith more. You got, a, you got the same amount of faith. You got Jesus' faith. Oh, I ain't got time. I got to hush. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on. Amen. You are not faithless. Woo, Jesus. God Almighty, you're a faith creature. You're a faith being. Hallelujah. Come on. Hallelujah. Come on, I love Otasaya. Oh, shout it, I got faith. Say it till you believe it. I got faith. 